Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Berean Baptist Church for this, our Sunday morning service. So glad to have each and every one of you here for the holiday season. As you can see, we've gone to green mode here. The fall colors are out the door and the Christmas colors are in the door. And this is such a wonderful time of year and I'm glad you're here with us. And so everybody grab a songbook. Brother Jim Guru is going to lead us in a song right now. All right, let's all stand and turn to number 490 as we sing for the very last time our monthly theme, Revive Us Again. All standing, please, if you can, 490. All together now. We praise Thee, O God, for the Son of Thy love, for Jesus who died and is now gone above. Hallelujah and the glory. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Find the glory. Revive us again. We praise thee, O God, for the spirit of light who has shown us our Savior scattered our night. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. All glory and praise to the Lamb that was slain, who is born, sins and has cleansed every stain. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. Revive us again. Fill each heart with thy love. May each soul be rekindled with fire from above. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. The Bible says, in him was life, and that life was the light of men. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Christmas, this time of year, is, has everything to do about life. In fact, the word divine means Christ's mass. Literally, the word mass means life. And so we are talking about life all the month of December, how important it is to know that we have a Savior and that we have a living Savior at that. And so we're going to begin with a word of prayer. So glad you're in service today. And let's just give thanks for God for his wonderful gift, the most special gift for us is that Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, that we have this wonderful opportunity to worship you and to know that you do all things well and to know that you are the author of life and we owe every breath to you today. And so we pray that you would use this special service to draw us closer to yourself, that you would make a difference in our hearts and lives and Lord, that we would not be content with the difference residing in us, but that we would share you with others so they can experience the difference as well. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated.
Very nice choir, thank you. Did you like that? Amen. All right, let's stand. We're going to sing our greeting hymn number 138. Since we're in the Christmas mood, we're going to sing, O Come All Ye Faithful. We'll sing the first verse and then greet one another, as we usually do. Then come back and sing the last. 138. Come, all ye faithful, joyful and triumphant. O oh, come, ye, O oh, come, ye to Bethlehem. Come and be old him, born a king of angels. O oh, come, let us. Adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Cries the Lord. All right, let's greet one another. All right, folks, let's get back to our places, please. Back to our places, singing 138, last verse. All right, all together on the third. Yea, Lord, we greet thee on this happy morning. Oh, just to thee be all glory. Word of the Father, now in flesh appearing. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Christ the Lord. And you may be seated. But keep your hymn books and turn to 298. Now I belong to Jesus. Amen.
needed at this time. Okay, new bulletin of the month, festive green color, festive green. If you have orange, you're lost in time. So if you need one, just raise your hand. We'll make sure that we get these to you. Just looking around, looking around, very good. Killian, go ahead and have a seat, buddy. Go ahead and sit down right now. Thank you very much. So uh, right here, over here, Caleb, if you could help Frischwa out and get one for him. Good to have each and every one of you here. Um, I don't know what normal is, but we're departing from it because it is going to get very, very busy this time of year. Very exciting time of year, and I'm glad that you're here with us. And I hope that you're able to take it all in. Um, we're, we're not humbuggy here. Sorry about that. We're just not. Uh, I know when it comes to uh, the Christmas holidays, I am all in, and I like it. Um, I know some of you don't. I like peppermint mochas, just letting you know, okay? I'm all in. I'm peppermint mocha man. Uh, I like Christmas lights. I, I like food. I like all sorts of different kinds of food that show up this time of year. Uh, my wife makes certain desserts this time of year. She makes no other time, okay? And uh, now I may, you know, I may have a four alarm, and then next thing I know, uh, you know, Raquel's trying to get money out of me. But uh, at this time at the hospital, but I really, really love uh, this time of year, and I hope that you will enjoy it, enjoy everything uh, about it, because it's all about Jesus. And, you know, cut through everything else and just understand it's all about Jesus, and so you can go around with a smile on your face even if somebody's grumpy. And, uh, you know, maybe you don't want to smile bigger at somebody who's grumpy and help them understand this. So, with Christmas, Christmas choir is going on right now, 4.44 p.m. Do not forget the choir. Choir, by the way, will be singing on the 17th, but the choir is also singing on Christmas Eve. And it's going to be a very, very special Sunday. That Sunday, Christmas Eve, uh, we will not have Sunday school. We realize it's an intense time, but we will have a Christmas Eve service. We will have our uh, we will have that morning service. We will have that 45-minute 6 o'clock service on Sunday night, and we do it up wonderful, and there's Christmas carols, and there's scripture readings, and there's special music, and nobody announces anything. It just goes. It just goes click, click, click. People are stepping up and leaning in songs and reading scripture and reading poems and doing specials, and I only get five minutes at the end, Okay. It's the only time you ever hear from me ever a sermonette, okay? Don't ever call me a pastorette. But uh, anyway, I, I know my pronouns, and I know them well. They're he, him. Thought I'd let you know. So anyway, but uh, I will let you know. It's going to be a wonderful time. It's something to invite the family to, not take the family from. And it's a special time, and we really, really enjoy that. So letting you know uh, that is taking place. And, of course, all the regular things that take place during the week. Um, making mention of this, next Sunday, adult Sunday school class will be downstairs. The teens and adults combined downstairs, 10 o'clock. There will be a Christmas rehearsal taking place in the 10 o'clock hour on Sunday. The day before, this coming Saturday, uh, there's going to be a Christmas rehearsal with uh, everybody who is involved in the Sunday School Christmas program. That starts at 10 o'clock on Saturday. Men will still have men's prayer um, on that morning as well. Then the 11th through the 15th, we do it differently during the Christmas holidays. It's outreach week. We're gonna have uh, four by six invitation cards that you can pass out all over town uh, regarding everything that we have happening uh, regarding the Christmas holiday. You will enjoy that. Next Sunday night, we're going to have our Christmas song request time, our Christmas singspiration, and that is where you get to request your favorite Christmas song, and we have more than one hymnal in the pew. We'll have two hymnals in the pew uh, next Sunday night for that. After that, teens, we have a, a teen Christmas activity that's taking place at our house. Uh, Brother Andrew Goodman and his wife Megan, they are, they are uh, running it, but uh, we're going to get together for Christmas time, and that'll be after that. We also do have next Sunday morning the Lord's Table that is taking place. I mean, we need to understand, if we're going to talk about what Jesus started, let's talk about what Jesus finished as well. 
and he died for our sins. And so many, many things taking place. A week from Wednesday, we'll have a special business meeting before the end of the year. Uh, we may be talking about missionaries. If God uh, blesses us, and it looks like he's going to, uh, sometimes we have surplus funds, and we want to distribute that uh, to needs that exist among our missionary family. On December 31st, we will have our annual missionary offering. We do this every year, the final service of the year, and we give it to a special ministry need that we know. Tonight I'll be talking uh, more about that. Also that night, Christmas Eve night, we've got men's preaching at six o'clock. We're going to start it off right, and we'll have men's preaching, and then we will, at that point, then we will uh, migrate downstairs where you will, you will bring your Christmas leftovers. You know, all your snacks, all your favorite snacks and whatever you didn't get eaten. And uh, this is a, uh, this is a, let me, you know, Christmas Eve uh, is calorie free. I don't know how it happens. There are no calories in Christmas Eve snacks. Now, but it's a deferment. It's a calorie deferment. January 1st, all the calories pile back on. That's how it works. And uh, then you go and look for your exercise machines. And so, but anyway, we'll have that. We'll have a white elephant gift exchange also there on the 31st. And so anyway, just letting you know that that is happening. Other things happening, Christmas program, Sunday school hour the 17th, Christmas caroling, many, many things going on. Encourage you to study uh, this packed bulletin to understand everything that is happening. But uh, just so excited about this time of year. So at this time, we're going to have the men come forward. By the way, if anybody wants this devotional, I have one more dwell devotional here on the pulpit. It is first come, first serve, if anybody wants that, and they certainly can have that. And at this time, we'll receive our Sunday morning offering. Uh, this is an opportunity to give of our tithes and offerings, opportunity to give to missions as well and other needs in the ministry. And we do thank the good, obedient hearts of the membership of Berean Baptist Church and the generous hearts that give in so many ways so the gospel can go forward. Let's have a word of prayer at this time. Go to ask Brother Carl Niederwerfer if you would bless the offering, please. Father in heaven, we're truly thankful for so many gifts that you have given and the gift of uh, Jesus coming to, uh, because of love, Lord, because he loves us and and wants our soul saved. And Lord, we just praise you for that. We ask that you would help us to reflect on that and to uh, understand and, and uh, Lord, to give out the gospel as, as you would have us do. Lord, we love you for providing, provide uh, for the giver and help us to give out of a heart of love. We love you, Lord, and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Ladies, for that, I hold in my hands the Liam Revised Hymn Book. We're going to sing number one, if you would stand with me, please. Yes. Number one, My Savior's Love.
people singing thank you so much today especially south side baptist church you really bring it out north side baptist church you need to recruit a little bit right over there but anyway glad to have you here um brother jim's inside joke about the liam revised version um sometimes you discover um it turns out that the song we sang is liam's favorite song and he tore it right out of the song leader song book and took it with him so anyway and so we but uh anyway of course uh, liam now one year old amazing and you know he's a boy he's all boy and so anyway just letting you know that and enjoy joy having him uh we like babies in the church liam and and tessa uh the the new little ones I'm always hoping for more. That's what I'm doing. I'm always hoping for more. I like growing a church the old-fashioned way. And so let's have, look in the Word of God uh, this morning. We're turning to Matthew chapter 1. Word of God, Matthew chapter 1. And uh, we're going to begin at the beginning. And we're going to talk about our Lord and Savior. Uh, we'll be talking about Him all month. We'll be talking about him all next year. We'll never stop talking about him. But this is a time where we reflect on the difference between wants and needs. Matthew chapter 1, we're looking in the Word of God together in starting in verse 18. Please look along with me. The Word of God says this, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. When as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privately. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, Thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife. For that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Let us have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, your great goodness to us in that you saw our state and you had a remedy and your remedy was Jesus and you still see our state and you have a remedy and the remedy is still Jesus and I pray Lord that something about you today would become very, very personal to us and that you would help us through your word in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I have observed that it is very, very easy to intellectually acknowledge some things but far different to experience them. Um, as a young boy at uh, six years old, I was intellectual. And I intellectually acknowledged the law of gravity. But to intellectually acknowledge the law of gravity and to experience it are two different things. And I saw older boys, and they're jumping off some scaffolding, look like maybe six to eight feet off the ground, and they seemed to be okay. And I thought, that looks fun to do. And I asked my younger brother, said, uh, and he said, why don't you go do that? Uh, this is a later time, and I looked at my younger brother and said, have you done that? He says, oh, yeah, I've done that. Well, my younger brother, you know, at that point, he's only four years old. I'm not going to be beat out by my younger brother who jumped off that scaffolding. So I jumped off that scaffolding, and I experienced the law of gravity. And after my ankle turned and I was laying there on the ground crying, I said to my brother, did you really jump off that? He went, no. And so... Anyway, it's one thing to experience something. It's one thing to intellectually know as you walk by the Starbucks kiosk at Safeway that they have peppermint mochas. It's one thing to intellectually acknowledge that. It's another thing to taste 
a peppermint mocha. When you taste a peppermint mocha, all your whole world changes. Now you may go, well, pastor, I don't like chocolate. And you may go, I don't like peppermint. See, you proved my point exactly. If you were to taste a peppermint mocha, not liking chocolate, not liking peppermint, your whole, whole world would change. Different than me, but your whole world would still change. How about pets? It's one thing to intellectually acknowledge the existence of pets. There is a lady across the street. She has this beautiful black Labrador named George. And George barks with a big, deep, gruff bark. And uh, he does that. Caleb, if you would close that door for me. Thank you so much. Anyway, he barks uh, gruffly. And he looks like a very friendly dog. And I intellectually acknowledge the existence of George. But George does not live in my house. Because if George lived in my house, that would be an entirely different experience than intellectually knowledge. I have a nameless stuffed dog that lives in my house. I do not have to feed him. I do not have to potty train him. But, uh, but Sarah Flanagan acknowledges that that dog has the most dangerous looking eyes of any stuffed dog that exists. And so, but I do not, but it's one thing. So we come down to this. We come down to the fact there was a proclamation of angels in Luke chapter 2, verse 11, that said, For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And we can intellectually acknowledge the angelic proclamation. We can intellectually acknowledge the existence of what a manger scene might have looked like. But it's, one, it's a totally entirely different thing to experience your Savior. Some know He came. Many they don't even want a savior. They kind of look at it like a peppermint mocha at Starbucks. I don't like chocolate and I don't like peppermint. And they treat Jesus the same way. There are many who do not want a savior, but everyone needs a savior. So it is time for a personal question. Not looking at anybody else in the room. Why do you need a savior and that is the question that we are going to answer this morning looking at Matthew chapter 1 verse 21 for some of the answers here and it said and she shall bring forth a son and thou shalt call his name Jesus for he shall save his people from their sins. And indeed, the name Jesus, by its very definition, means God saves or Jehovah is Savior. So we have this reality, but we have what he is saving people from. He shall save his people from their sins. And so, why do you need a Savior? And here's the reality. Because of your sins. And by the way, when I preach that to you, I'm preaching that to me as well. I'm looking in the mirror. Why do I need a Savior? I need a Savior because of my sins. And the Bible says the problem of sin that exists in our lives is plainly evident. In Isaiah 59, 2, the Bible says, but your iniquities have separated between you and your God. And your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. And to give you an example here, Benjamin, you are accessible. So Benjamin, you will be my example. So Benjamin, come on up here and give you an example and understand that we can intellectually acknowledge that Jesus is a Savior, but we have to also intellectually acknowledge that sin creates an obstacle for relationships. So I go, Benjamin, come here. Let me give you a hand. You're such a good friend of mine. Okay? But we are really, really, really good friends. Okay? You're just really, really good friends. And I want to let you know that I like you very much. And I acknowledge you. 
and I even come to see you every Sunday. You are a good friend of mine. You know, there may come a time where he gets tired of being kicked in the shin. You may be seated, and I want you to realize that you'll have a breach in a relationship if you mistreat somebody too many times. And so we have, a, we have this reality here of that. And so as we look at these things, I want you to understand that it says sins have separated us from Almighty God. And we have to realize that sin is not just simply an action issue. Sin is a relational issue. And so we deal with that and we deal with the relationship. Everybody's looking. It's okay. They're supposed to come back. I'm letting you know that. Okay, okay, they, they, they've not, no, it's, they didn't get kicked out of anything. They did their job. They've come back. And so that's it. Get used to a lot of moving around before we have a Christmas program here. And so anyway, so we have this reality. You know, why do you need a Savior? You need a Savior because of your sins. They have separated you from God. Here's something else. Your sins are killing you. Literally. Your sins are literally I'm not talking about spiritually. Your sins are physically killing you. In the Bible, we have that proof that is found in Scripture. And you know, when I was a young preacher, I never really understood this. But as I get older, I actually watch it happen with people. And the Bible says this. The Bible says in James 1.14, But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. It means his own sinful desires. And he's just following his desires. He's following his nose. And it says this, and when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And when sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. And some people, they don't understand this. And they go, well, certainly he's talking about spiritual sin. No, God is not talking about the idea of the spiritual issue. Because let me tell you something about the spiritual issue. One sin sends us to hell. The wages of sin singular is death. So this is talking about some. This is talking about a sinful progression in a person's life. Now it could be a drug addiction. Uh, it could be an alcohol addiction. It could be a smoking addiction. It could be a lying addiction. It could be a pride addiction. It could be a stubbornness addiction. But I've noticed that sin has a death sentence and sin has a progression. I never ever used to think that someone could die of pride. But I've discovered differently. I've lived long enough to see pride kill a person. You know, when a doctor says, hey, you should take this medication, they go, I'm not going to take it. And then what do you know? They die. Or they say, you need to take this regularly every day. You cannot take it on again, off again, or something will happen. I watched a person die from that because they kind of hit missed on their medication. They just decided to take it when they wanted, decide when they didn't. Okay. Uh, I actually said this one time, visited somebody in the hospital and actually said to them, I said, did you know that stubbornness is terminal? I actually said that in the hospital one time. Now you have to earn the right to say that or you have to duck when the left hook comes, one of the two. But the reality is, is all sin in its progression brings forth death. This is why you need a savior. Your sins are killing you. Not only that, your sins are taking you out of the race. What you want to do rightly and what you want to do for God and the good things you want to do and the good intentions you have, sin is taking you out of the race. The Bible says, Wherefore we also are compassed with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us. And the idea of being said is the idea that there are competitors and you are being taken out of the race. You're losing your kick. You're losing your stride. And the other reason your sins require a Savior is the price is too high. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. And the price to pay for sin, it's too high. You can't pay for it. There's only one person who can pay for that. And whoever that person is who can pay for your sins is your savior and you are not your own savior this is why many people never come to christ they want to be their own savior they say i can figure this out on my own and the thing is no you can't and the reality is is there's a god in heaven who loves you very much who 
sent a savior. They didn't send Jesus to be somebody's savior. God sent Jesus to you personally to be your savior. Personally. And so why do you need a savior? One is because of your sins. And the other is because of your path. Look with me at Luke 19.10. And these are the Jesus' own words as he walked along this earth and was doing his ministry. And he said, Jesus says, this is why I came. Luke 19.10. And the Bible says, for the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. And so why do you need a Savior? You need a Savior because of your path. Because of your direction in life. You need a Savior. I'm going to put it this way. You need somebody to save you from yourself. You know, sometimes, uh, one time a person said, a theologian is a man educated beyond his own intelligence. In other words, he has an intellectual ascent of God, but he's never experienced him personally. This is a major problem. This is why uh, when I went to Bible college, we had a nickname for seminaries. We called them cemeteries. That is where people learned to become theologically brilliant and died inside. We don't want to die inside. You need a savior because of your path. Why because of our path? Because you know what? Every single one of you, you have your own way of doing things. You have your own way. Have you ever met anybody and you said they have their own way of doing things and I must admit their own way is rather unique. Okay, that's a very kind way of putting it. They have their own way of doing things. Now, I, was a, I love geometry. I, mean, I, I was a geometry kid. Everybody has their favorite part of math. Some people hate one math subject. Other people love one math subject um, they go what about calculus I don't know I was never smart enough to take it but uh, but I love geometry and because geometry had rules that made sense and one of the rules in geometry was the shortest distance between two points is a straight line that's when I discovered many people I know do not live by geometry and you know some of them the shortest distance between two points is a very squiggly, arching, running line. They may eventually somehow get there, but they didn't go this way to get there. And this is why we need a Savior, because God in heaven knows the shortest distance between two points is a straight line, because that's how he created a straight line. The Bible says in Isaiah, looking in chapter 53, verse 6, all we like sheep have gone astray. Wow. How did that happen? We have turned everyone to his own way. That's how that happened. And so we need a Savior because our own way, by God's Bible definition, is called astray. And we need to know what God's way is instead of our way this is why it says the lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all because sometimes astray involves sin sometimes it's astray involved just force of our own will our own way is called astray why do we need a savior because of your path and the reality is is we need a personal guide anybody ever heard of a life coach anybody heard of a life coach that's somebody you pay good money to to help guide your life you know what? Jesus wants to be your life coach. He charges a whole lot less. Just so I'd let you know. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 9, looking at verse 36. It says, And when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. You need a Savior because you need a personal guide. You need somebody to help you in life. You need somebody to guide you in life. You need somebody who actually spoke words and they were right 100% of the time. Anybody ever got guidance in their life and then they didn't work and you went back to the person who guided you and they went, oh, oops. That's a lot of fun. 
Thank you, you just ruined my life. And all you could say is, oops. It's an interesting thing. It gets scary when a doctor goes, oops. Okay, Mrs. Wife, Mrs. Wife, Mrs. Watkins, she is my wife, okay? Mrs. Watkins was uh, having hand surgery and uh, she, was, she was under the knife and she was anesthetized and uh, she began to become unanesthetized and she began to come to and she heard the hand doctor use a choice word it wasn't a church word, but it meant oops. <laughs> and my wife said, I heard that. And somebody went, uh-oh. Next thing she knew, she was anesthetized again. And so, but understand that. You need a personal guide in your life. And also this. There's going to come a day if you're on the wrong path and you're on the wrong track and you discover that you're out in the Thule's. You're going to need a way back. The Bible says in Luke chapter 15, book of Luke chapter 15, and we're talking about the prodigal son here, and you wonder, how did he get so far off the path? And the reality is, is he had a little help, but it says in verse 13 of Luke 15, it says, and not many days after, the younger son gathered all together took his journey into a far country and there wasted his substance with riotous living. But guess what? He finally came to. I have some grieving parents in this congregation. You may be a grieving parent. You may be a grieving grandparent. And all you pray all the time is for your son or your daughter or your granddaughter, son or your granddaughter, wherever they are, to come to. That's what you're praying for. And it does happen, but when it happens, verse 17, it says, and when he came to, my, came to himself, when all of a sudden he came to his senses, when all of a sudden he was aware that he had been following his nose and his nose by following his own way, it turned out to be astray and he had allowed himself to become his personal guide. Now he was out way in the Thule's. He never met his goals in life. He never got to where he wanted to do and now he's in trouble. And it said, and when he came to himself, he said, how many hired servants of my father's have bread enough to spare and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. You need a savior because when you come to yourself, you need a path to get back. And you need a guide to help you get back. And here's the wonderful thing about your Savior. Your Savior has wonderful shepherding skills. Thought I'd let you know that. He is a wonderful guide. The Bible says in Psalm 23, verse 2, He maketh me lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. Some people don't want a Savior. But everybody needs a Savior. And you need a Savior. Why? Number one, because of your sins, present company included. Number two, because of your path, present company included. Number three, turn with me to Matthew chapter 16. The book of Matthew chapter 16 and looking at verse 24. Then said Jesus unto his disciples. This is important to understand. You can become a committed follower of Jesus Christ and you are still going to need help. You're still going to need a course correction. You're still going to need a revelation as far as what the word of God says. You're going to need something new in God's word to jump off the page and smack you in the face. It's the best way I can put it. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, 
Let him deny himself. Well, what does that mean? Well, that's all a point too. You need a savior because of your path, because of your own goals. Says, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. And the idea of life here is the idea we all have career goals and we all have career plans and we all want to do something or more dangerous. We all want to be something. There's nothing more dangerous than wanting to be something because in Christ, God will already make you something. You don't need to be something. God will make you something. But in order for that to ever happen, you have to deny yourself. And you have to say, God, I'm going to wrap my identity in you. I'm going to wrap my life in you. And so you need a Savior, not just because of your sins and not just because of your path. You need a Savior because of your life. And this is the important thing to understand about salvation. Sometimes we find ourselves in trouble because we look at salvation as transactional in nature I went to the free gospel store I got my salvation patch I put it on my shoulder job done and now I can do anything I want and go anywhere I want and live any way I want and I just don't understand why I'm so unhappy all the time and the reason is, is because salvation is more than a moment. Salvation is a life. Salvation is a lifetime. The Bible says in Philippians 2, verse 12, Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. Look at this phrase here. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. You go, well, I thought I was already saved. And the answer is, yeah, you already are. You're saved today, and you're saved tomorrow. You're saved the next day. You're saved the day after that. You're saved the day after that. But you have to live the saved life. And you're, God's never going to take your salvation away. But you're never going to understand your life unless you live the saved life. And you wake up every morning and you go, I am a saved person in Jesus Christ and I am going to live the saved life in Jesus Christ. There is nobody more miserable on planet earth, even the lost are less miserable than a saved person not living the Christian life. And when you're saved, God has made you to live the saved life. It's a lifetime. Now, I want to tell you this. Jesus wants you to enjoy the saved life. That's why he gave you salvation. That's why he gave you the Holy Spirit of God. That's why he gave you the saved life so you could enjoy living the saved life. Jesus put it this way in John 10.10. 10, the thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life. Here it comes. And that they might have it more abundantly. Are you bored in your life? I'll tell you why you're bored. I already know. You're not living the Christian life. Because let me tell you something. You live the Christian life, you can kiss boredom goodbye for the rest of your life. Most people I know that are living the Christian life actually pray for boredom. And it never comes. Because there's something amazing about actually living the Christian life because what's going to happen is people are going, God's going to bring people across your path. God's going to bring phone calls into your life. God's going to bring you text messages. That's why you have to go dark all the time, especially in church, by the way. You've got to go dark. And so, but we have these realities in that God wants you to live the Christian life. It is an amazing life. It is a wonderful life. It is a blessed life. Now, it says that that person will also have persecutions. You read Mark chapter, it says Mark, and it says, he who hath left father and mother shall receive in his day, and it talks about receiving 
uh, wives and daughters and mothers and houses and lands. Then it puts in this little phrase I don't like, with persecutions. Why did Jesus put that in? And in the world to come, everlasting life. But this is important. Christ wants you to enjoy the saved life. And Jesus is maintaining your salvation every day. Uh, well, I thought it was a once and done thing. Oh, really? That's why Jesus is sitting at the right hand of God. This is why it says, Wherefore he is also able to save to the uttermost them that come to God by him, seeing that he ever liveth to make intercession for him. What does that mean? Jesus is making intercession for you every day. Well, why does he need to do that? I don't know. Something about going your own way. Something about sin. Something about, I want to be somebody when God already wants you to make somebody. And so Jesus is up there endlessly interceding because right now the devil's up there endlessly accusing. Night and day, the Bible says. Jesus is maintaining your salvation every single day. I'm happy to tell you, he will never take a day off. I'm letting you know that. And that's important. And so we have Jesus daily maintaining your salvation. And when we get back, let's look again, if you're still there, Matthew 16, verse 25. And understand, Jesus is offering you a trade. Jesus, your Savior, is offering you a trade. I'll trade you, your life plan for my life plan. Jesus is saying, I'll make a trade here. You give me your life plan, I'll give you my life plan. And the Bible says this. It says, for whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life, the idea of plan, the idea of identity, for my sake shall find it. So let's review. Why do you need a Savior? Because of your sins, mine included. Because of your path. Me too. Because of your life. Mine too. So here's the conclusion for every single one of us in this room. You need Christ. Every single one of you. Christmas is about Christ. And you need Christ. You didn't just need him the day you were saved. You need him every day after as well. You still need him. Let us look as a closing passage, Matthew chapter 11, looking at verse 28. Matthew 11, verse 28. And Jesus knows us. And he says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And right now you are sitting here thinking, that verse is for me not understanding that the person next to you is thinking the same thing and the person across the aisle is thinking the same thing and you would go well I thought they had their whole life together we are all the same in this room welcome to the even playing field we're all in the same boat there's not a single person in this room who has not experienced weariness in spirit there is not a person in this room that hasn't experienced burdens so heavy they didn't think they could bear them. We are all in the same boat and we are all in the same situation and Jesus is saying, why don't you come to me and I'll give you rest. He says, let's make a trade here. Take my yoke upon you. And what Jesus is saying is, here's what I'll do. We'll trade burdens. I will bear your burdens and you can bear mine. It's a pretty nice trade. Because Jesus being God has zero trouble bearing your burdens. And you'll discover that God doesn't have any burdens to bear. He doesn't. God is, God is burden free. He's not laden down with everything. You know what? Every day is a good day in heaven. And I picture God on his throne with a smile on his face. 
every day. We have bad days here. He doesn't have good. And he says, why don't we make a trade? I'll give you my burden. I'll take your burden. That is a really, really good trade. And you go, by the way, he offers that to you every single day. Every single day he offers that to you. And the Bible says this, Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. There will always be burdens in life, but Jesus offers to shoulder yours. Jesus offers to shoulder the burden of eternity. And that's eternal life. But he also offers to shoulder the burden of the day. And that's today. And the reality is, you need a Savior today. And so do I. So let's let Jesus meet our needs today. Let's have a word of prayer. With heads bowed and eyes closed, nobody looking around, people praying, we will have a song of invitation in a moment. The greatest burden anyone can have is the burden that they don't know where they're going to spend eternity. I can't think of a heavier burden on a person's life if you do not know for sure that you're saved. And if you do not know that for sure, you need a Savior today. And with heads bowed and eyes closed, there may be somebody here and you're feeling that burden. You say, Pastor, pray for me. I am shouldering a burden like that. And I'm not sure, and I want to be sure if that would be you, nobody else looking. Slip your hand up, slip your hand down. Anybody at all may say pastor no that's not it but I do have burdens and I do need a savior to help me with my burdens today would you pray for me Uh, quickly just slip your hands up say that's me pastor I'm carrying a burden I need God to help me hands up all over both young and old anyone else may put your hands down dear heavenly father I thank you so much that you loved us so much that you sent us a Savior in your Son, Jesus Christ. And we thank you for him. And we come before you, Lord, acknowledging that we need him. We need him this day. And we know you're the only one who can help us. We admit sometimes we've taken a wrong turn. We've done a wrong thing tried to live a life that isn't the life you want for us. But I know you can help us. And I pray that you would help us this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together. The song is number 61, number 61. Beneath the cross of Jesus, this is where we find the help And this is where we find that God can be a help to us. Let's stand together, number 61. If you have a need, the altar is open. You come and you talk to the Lord and you cast your cares upon him because he cares for you. You come while we sing this song right now.
pray for them. There's a God who has an answer. And there's a God even sometimes when you think, well, I think he's given up on my child. He has not given up. And he will not give up. So we do not dare go into his throne room having given up. We need to talk to him again and again. Whatever the need is of your heart, whatever the burden is of your heart, the Savior is waiting. The Savior wants to help you right now. Will you come and will you talk to him? Ask him for this help at this time. Speak to your Savior today. Would you come?